Now I'd ask that you please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2. As you're turning there, I also want to show you here on the screen, uh, we have a picture of Mike and Heidi's new edition. This is Eowyn Grace Rose Neglia, born on Thursday night and is now home, healthy and strong. Praise God for showing such kindness. She is, she is beautiful, isn't she? Uh, we're going to be letting you know very soon about how we can help the Neglia family with meals, so you should expect an email about that sign-up coming out today. Uh, today we are going to be continuing our series of systematic sermons on the nature of salvation, or soteriology. Uh, let me just give you a brief recap of what we have learned so far over the last few weeks. We began with a sermon about God's sovereignty over all things, and in that sermon we asked the question, can God do whatever he wants? And of course the answer is yes, because our God is in the heavens, he does whatever he pleases. And then we began walking through a set of doctrines that has come to be known as the doctrines of grace, or Reformed soteriology, or the five points of Calvinism. Now it can be easily remembered, the five points, through the acrostic TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. T is for total depravity, and in that sermon we learned that man is completely affected by the fall of Adam, and that we are unable to respond to the gospel apart from the initiating work of the Lord. Unconditional election is that before time began, God chose a particular people upon whom he has chosen to set his affection, and he made this choice based upon nothing but the good pleasure of his will. L stands for limited atonement or particular redemption, and this is what we learned about last week, that Christ came to die specifically for the elect of God. That was his mission, and he completed it perfectly. And there are two letters left in the acrostic, I for irresistible grace, that's what we're covering today, and P for perseverance of the saints. Today, as we consider irresistible grace, I would ask that we first come before the Lord humbly and we ask that he would help us, both myself in the preaching of the word and for all of us in the receptivity of the word this morning. So let's first go to him in prayer. Our God in heaven, we love you and we thank you that you loved us first and we come before you today asking that you would help us and show us truth from the word. I ask, Lord, that every word that I say today would be true and accurate and helpful to the people. And I ask, Lord, that you would cause us to be uh, people that are receptive to the scripture and that we would receive it with ears to hear, given by the Spirit, so that we might apply and carry out these truths in our lives. And Lord, I pray that in all of this, it would cause us to be in awe of your grace and to be completely enraptured by your love so that we might love you more in response. And we pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I am by no means a technician or an engineer. I am generally a big picture guy. But I am always amazed at people who are engineers or technicians and who are very focused on detail. They have a knack for looking at something and mentally breaking it down into its basic components. And they can look at a system and quickly ascertain what are the causes and what are the effects. And in doing so, engineers and technicians are masters at examining a system and diagramming its function. Well, that's how we're going to start our time together this morning, is by diagramming the function of salvation for you. Here is the order of salvation according to the Bible. We begin with election and predestination. Then comes the atonement of Christ at the cross. Then, in time, you are going to experience an outward call where somebody shares the gospel with you, and then you will receive an inward call by which the Spirit draws you, at which point your heart is regenerated or is given the new birth, then you experience conversion, which is faith and repentance, and that is when you are justified, which is where the work of Christ on the cross is applied to your life, and then after you are justified, your life begins to change, and you are sanctified until the day when you die and enter into eternity, at which point you are glorified. That's what the scholars call the ordo salutis, or the order of salvation. Now, you could think about it in this way. Total depravity displays our need for salvation. Unconditional election shows us the plan of salvation. Limited atonement is about the purchase of salvation at the cross. And today we look about how that process results in our salvation as God applies salvation to us. It was accomplished at the cross, applied in time by the Spirit. How does someone get saved? If God elects, 
How does faith or belief in the gospel fit into that equation? Or here is the big question of the day. What causes someone to come to Christ? As has been our custom in this series, we are going to employ the strategy of just asking the Bible a lot of questions. And in particular today, we are going to ask 10 questions about irresistible grace, and then we are going to use those questions to answer our big question, what causes someone to come to Christ? And then we will close with six points of practical application. So, we begin with question number one, what is the doctrine of irresistible grace? The doctrine, quite simply, is that God does a work of regeneration in the heart of a believer that results in their salvation. God does that work for us. The second question is, where do Calvinists and Arminians agree? Again, I always like to find as much ground for agreement that I can, knowing that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we love the same Lord, and that those who disagree with me on what I will say today are people with whom I will enjoy eternity, and I by no means want to divide where we should not divide. So where can we find common ground? Well, first, we all believe that we should preach the gospel to everyone. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the Great Commission, go therefore... And then we also believe that everyone, in order to be saved, must be born again. John 3.3 3 was read for us earlier so well. Jeff, thank you. You must be born again. And we also believe that we are saved by grace through faith, that it is not of works that we are saved. We also all agree that repentance is necessary to be saved, and we also all agree that the elect of God and only the elect will be in heaven. We just disagree on how that actually results in them getting there. So the third question is, then what is the difference of the outward call and the effectual call? Now I ask this question because this is where we tend to most sharply disagree. The outward call is what happens whenever a person shares the gospel with another person. Everyone agrees on this. So when I stand here Sunday after Sunday and I say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Repent and believe for the salvation of your souls. Praise God, that is a good message and that is what I will say. That is what you should say. That is what we all must do as we share the gospel because that outward call is what we are told to do in evangelizing the world. That's the outward call. Calvinists and Arminians agree for the most part about this outward call. We Agree that in order to be saved, someone must first hear that gospel call. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You cannot be saved unless you first hear the good news from an outward call. We believe in this. And we see Jesus speaking about this call when he says in Matthew twenty two fourteen 14, that many are called, many hear this message, but few are chosen. That word chosen you should be familiar with. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Is the Greek word electon or the elect of God. Many are called outwardly with the gospel, but only the elect will respond in faith. But there is also something called the inward call, or the divine call, or the effectual call. Now this is where we find the big disagreement between Calvinists and Arminians. Arminians would describe the call from God like a phone call that you might receive. So let's just take the example. I give you a call this week, and you may be busy, or you might not want to answer for some reason, and you look at the phone and you see that's my name at the top, and you have the two buttons. You've got the green one or the red one, and you have a choice in front of you. And you can make the choice to either accept that call, or you can make the choice to reject that call. And that is, generally speaking, how Arminians express and explain the call of the Lord. Can you send God to voicemail? That's the question. And the Arminian would say, yes, you can. You can reject God's call. When he is drawing you to himself, you can say no. However, for those who believe in the doctrines of grace, we believe that when God does the work of calling someone to himself, he ensures that they will come, not by overriding their will, but by changing them so that their will does desire him. In order to understand what I mean, let's look at two passages that speak about the effectual calling that God gives. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And then he explains that gospel and says, who saved us? Who did the saving? He does the saving. And how does he do that? And called us to a holy calling, 
not because of our works, but because of his own purpose in grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Who is it that does the work of salvation? It is God through the calling of his saints. So here we see that those whom God has saved, he has saved through the process of effectual calling. That is the part of the story of every single Christian who has ever been saved. There has never been, nor will there ever be, any Christian who says, I was saved, but God never called me. I came to him apart from his initial work of calling my heart to himself. No one will ever say that. But that doesn't answer the question about whether or not God's calling is effectual. It doesn't tell us whether or not everyone who receives that call will answer it. In order to see that, let's look at another passage that we have considered already multiple times in this series that we find in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30. Let's look at it from a different angle. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is what theologians refer to as the golden chain of redemption. It is unbreakable, indestructible, invulnerable. Notice that the subject of each category is the same. The same people that God foreknew are the exact same people that he has also predestined. And those that he has predestined are the exact same people that he has called. And those that he has called are the same people that God has justified. And those that he justified are the same ones that he glorifies, or in other words, takes to heaven. So if anyone will ever be in heaven, it is because God has called them. Today we are not looking at the predestining work, we are looking at the calling work of God, and the point is that everyone he calls will be in heaven according to this passage. What would be enough for us, that would be enough for us to simply say, well, amen, praise God, yes, when he calls people, he does something that none of us can do. When God calls people, he causes them to respond in such a way that it does result in salvation. But what we want to do is we want to break this down a little bit more to see why this is the case. And the simple answer is that when God calls someone to himself, there are other things that he does alongside of that call. And those things are going to be the focus of our next three questions. Question four, where does new birth, new life, and new creation come from? Sometimes when a word becomes so common in our society, we just stop thinking about it. We no longer pay attention to it. We don't think about it, what it means. And I think that's probably what's happened for most people with the term born again. Well, are you one of those born again Christians, people will ask us. I get that question a great deal from especially the Roman Catholic community. Are you one of those born agains? But how does someone get born again? What does that metaphor even mean? Earlier I showed you that wonderful, wonderful picture of, of the new baby that has come into the world from the Neglia family. Uh, this is a beautiful thing that we have seen, that there are so many things we don't know about her yet. She has so much great potential. There's so many questions we can't answer about her. But there is one thing I know for sure about her. She did not choose to be born. That was not her decision. She came into existence apart from herself. She was passive in that entire process. Similarly, you did not decide to be born. The people and procedures that existed before you came into existence determined that you would come into existence. Nobody decides to be born, nor does anybody decide to be born again. That is the entire point of the metaphor that Jesus is making, that it is not your decision to be born again. Let's look again at John 3 that was read for us earlier. Let's consider these words a little more closely. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't come in here, Nicodemus, unless you are born again. Well, then how does that happen? So Nicodemus asks him the question. Now, I think most people paint Nicodemus here as being a bit arrogant or being facetious when he asks this question to, to Jesus. I don't know that that's the case. I think he may legitimately be asking the question because the statement is so bizarre. He asks, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Like, this makes no sense to me. How can I, a physically elderly man, actually be born a second time? 
And he continues and says, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Here speaking of physiological birth. And Jesus answered him again. And whenever Jesus says anything, you pay attention. But when he says truly, truly before anything, he is making a significant statement of truth and says, I say to you, unless one is born of water, meaning physical birth, and born of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Do you see what Jesus is saying? To be born again literally means to be born of the Spirit. It is a work done by the Spirit, doing something apart from you, in you, that you could not do for yourself. You were previously dead, and he makes you alive. And when Nicodemus asked, how am I supposed to do this to Jesus? Jesus answered, well, you have to understand it's like the wind. Now, that word wind in Greek is the same word as spirit, so he's making a poetic parallel here. And he's like, okay, with the wind, what happens? It goes wherever it wants. You can't predict it. You can't force it. It goes wherever it wants. And that is the same way that the Holy Spirit brings life. He gives it to whomever he chooses. That is the point Jesus is making. The work of new birth or regeneration is not something that is done by you. It is something that is done for you and to you. You cannot make yourself be born again. That is why it is the work of God alone. We see this clearly in places like Titus Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, when he says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Bob, thank you for reading this earlier. How did he save us? Why did he save us? Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. That's why he did it. But how does he do it? By the washing of regeneration, that is new birth, and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So who does the work of regeneration? He does the work of regeneration. God does that in us and for us through the Holy Spirit. Or consider how 1 Peter 1, verse 3 puts it for us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How do we become born again? It was through his work in us. He caused our new birth. And here is the key to the entire sermon. Regeneration precedes faith. God must bring you to life before you will trust him or believe him. In order to show this to you, let's look at the best commentary ever written on the book of John. The book of 1 John. In that book, he looks back at all of these things that are in the gospel of John. And he explains them and clarifies them in a church context. And in that book, we see that John has a lot to say about the order of the new birth and other things. So, for example, 1 John 2, 9. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Have you been born again? Well, if you are displaying righteousness, it is an evidence that first came new birth. What comes first? Righteousness or being born of God. Clearly, the new birth comes first. Or 1 John 3, 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Again, what comes first? Our battle against sin or the new birth? What comes first clearly is the new birth. Or what about 1 John chapter 4, verse 7? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. What comes first? Our love for God and our love for others that Bob taught us so well about today? Or does new birth come first? Well, according to John, new birth comes first. And then here's the kicker. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been, past tense, born of God. What comes first? Our belief or our birth? Clearly, the scripture teaches that regeneration, new birth, comes before, precedes faith. God must do the work of giving us life before we can have faith. In order to understand that, let me borrow an extended quote from the late, great R.C. Sproul. He said, when we talk about regeneration preceding faith, 
This means that before a person exercises saving faith, before they believe in Christ, before that individual exercises his will or her will to embrace Christ, God must do something for them and in them so that faith can be exercised. It is not that the Holy Spirit drags people kicking and screaming against their will to come to Christ. The Holy Spirit changes the inclination and disposition of our heart so that while we were previously unwilling to embrace Christ, now we are willing and more than willing. Indeed, we aren't dragged to Christ. We run to Christ and we embrace him joyfully because the Spirit has changed our hearts. That heart is no longer a heart of stone, impervious to the commands of God and the invitations of the gospel. Praise God and well said, amen. When God does a work of regeneration, it changes our affections. Let's see another couple of ways that this new birth is spoken about metaphorically in the Bible and see how God is the one who accomplishes this work in us. In the Old Testament, the Bible will sometimes use the language of having a circumcised heart. In fact, that outward surgery that was a part of the Old Testament law was always there for the purpose of focusing in and pointing to the inward change that God does for a person. Who does the surgery of the heart? Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, one of many verses similar to this. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart your soul, your, and your soul, that you may live. So how do we respond to God with obedience? How do we respond to him with love? How do we respond to him in such a way that we live? Because he does a work of transformation, or in this case it speaks about circumcision, of our heart. Well, then we get to Ezekiel 36, and we see this metaphor of the new heart or the flesh that is replaced with a heart, uh, replaced uh, in place of a heart of stone. Where does it come from? Ezekiel says, from the words of the Lord, I will give you a new heart. Who does that? God does that. And a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I will cause you to do all of that. God is saying that is my work in you. Who does the work to give us a new heart? The Lord does. Paul uses another metaphor, the picture of creation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. If you're a Christian, that's you. The original creation, when God said, let there be light, light did not say, I don't feel like it today, God. No, thank you. I'm just going to stay wherever I am. I would prefer not to exist. Creation doesn't tell God no. When God decides to make something, he makes it. When he says, I will create something, he creates it. And the creation does not reject it. That is how your regeneration is described by God. So to summarize, when God calls someone, he causes them to be born again. And that work of new birth or regeneration precedes faith, which leads us to our next question. Well, if that's true, then where does faith come from? We all agree that without faith, it is impossible to please God. If anyone is going to be saved, they must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace through faith. But how does faith show up in a person who has no faith? How does it get there? Uh, let me tell you about a friend of mine. His name is Vinny, Vinny Nizzo, or Niz as he likes to be called. Niz was a bricklayer in Brooklyn, real New York Italian guy. And my friend Niz, also a bit of a hippie, uh, just an incredible life story. He and his wife ended up going and squatting on land in Oregon and building a cabin and then coming back to New York. I mean, their whole life story is just amazing. But somewhere along the way, the most amazing part is that his wife, Josie, came to know the Lord in a saving way. And Josie followed after Christ and tried as much as possible to bring him to Christ, and she prayed for him for 27 years to know Christ. Well, then one day in April of 2008, Vinny walked into a church service. He said, quite literally, I just went to keep my wife company. And I spoke to him about this yesterday, and his words were, when I walked into that church, I was not looking for God. I could not have been more disinterested in God, but there God came looking for me. 
That day, Niz heard the gospel, and he is now one of the people that I know who loves Jesus more than anyone else in the world. In fact, almost every day of my life, I get a text from him before I wake up in the morning that is a poem that he has written about whatever he is reading the scripture or about what he is contemplating on and meditating upon about the love of God. He loves the Lord. How did that happen? How did he go from being completely disinterested when he walked in the door to being completely transformed? How does that happen for any of us? Well, in order to answer that, let's not look at just human experience in, uh, from our perspective. Let's look at what the Bible says. Let's look at a woman named Lydia who went through something similar. Lydia was a wealthy businesswoman who had specialized in purple dyes. That means she had lots of money. And we read about her story of salvation in Acts chapter 16. And in verse 14 it says, One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. Well, how did this happen? Because the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Now, you might say, well, it says the Lord opened her eyes to pay attention, opened her heart to pay attention, but it doesn't say he opened her heart to be saved. But listen to the very next verse. After, and after she was baptized, and her whole household as well, and she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay, and she prevailed upon us. So clearly, Paul thought that whatever happened there in her opening of her understanding, the opening of her heart to believe, he saw this as a way of salvation. He believed that this means she was saved. And how did that happen? It was by the work of the Lord to open her heart to the gospel. Later, Paul wrote to Lydia's church. The same woman was involved in the congregation there at Philippi, and he said this to them, For it has been granted you... I'm sorry, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Now, clearly the main point of his, te- uh, of his statement here in this text is saying, look, you're going to suffer, and that is not a, a punishment. That's actually a gift from God. God is granting this to you. But notice, don't overlook that little parenthetical statement. He assumes that they know full well that God is the one who granted faith to you. He granted it to you to believe. How does someone have faith? It is granted to them. Or let me read it again. It is for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe. In other words, it's for the sake of Christ that you should believe in him. It has been granted to you for his sake that you would believe. If you still have your fingers in Ephesians 2, please look there now. We're going to focus in on two verses today, verses 8 and 9 where it reads this way, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Yes, we believe you are saved by faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Notice that the scripture is abundantly clear that your faith does not originate within yourself. This is not your own doing. Underline those words in your Bible. Keep your fingers there. We're going to return there in a bit. But focus on that truth. Your faith is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. Everyone that calls, uh, that the Spirit calls, he has also regenerated. And those that he regenerated, he gives the gift of faith. But faith has a twin that always comes along with it. The other side of the coin of faith is the gift of repentance, which leads us to our sixth question. Where does repentance come from? In Acts chapter 11, the gospel went forth to the, the Gentiles in dramatic fashion. There we see the Jewish Christians uh, are then responding to this newfound reality that the gospel is not just for the Jews, but it has crossed the boundary into the Gentile world, and that they they are seeking to understand what's happening here. And here's how they respond when they hear the news from Peter about Cornelius and his family coming to Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit. It says, when they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God saying, I'm just really glad they figured it out. No. He says, it says, how did the Gentiles receive it? That they have been granted by God to lead, uh, I'm sorry, then how the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. How did they have repentance? God granted it to them, leading to life. Their repentance was a gift from God. God gave it to them. Now we see very similar words in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. Uh, correcting his opponents with gentleness, we read, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of truth. 
if these people are to repent, how is it going to happen? God will give it to them. He will grant it to them. So where does repentance come from? It comes from the hand of a gracious God himself. Your new birth, your faith, your repentance are all gifts from the hand of God. So now the next three questions will hopefully serve to address the most common objections to this doctrine. Question seven, do we see any examples of someone resisting God's call to salvation? In fact, don't we see that happening all the time, that people resist his call? And this question is often asked by people who are confused about what the meaning of irresistible grace really is. They take the term irresistible to mean that the first time an elect person hears the gospel, they will automatically and immediately respond with faith and repentance. But that is not how it works. That does not mean that every time the outward call comes to them, it will be effectual. In fact, let's consider exhibit A, Paul himself. Where was he the day that the first martyr, Stephen, was stoned? He was listening with the Sanhedrin, and he was there when Stephen said these words at the end of his sermon. Stephen said, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Do they resist the Spirit? Yes. The unsaved person always resists the Holy Spirit. That is our nature. That is our approach to God in every occasion of hearing the gospel, unless God does a work in us. Do people resist the Spirit? Yes. The unregenerate person will always resist the Spirit. Paul heard the gospel that day, and he rejected it. In fact, his response was not to believe. He walked out of that room, and then he got paid to hold the coats of the people that killed the preacher that day, and so much so that he went on to then rampage against the people of God and kill as many or imprison as many as possible. Yes, people do resist. You probably did not get saved the first time you heard the gospel. Why not? Because you resisted the Holy Spirit. That is how we respond. Vinny Nizzo did not get saved the first time he heard the gospel. It took 27 years. So then how does it happen? Because God waited to intervene in Paul's life. Jesus did not show up to him that day with Stephen. Jesus did show up and change his life that day on the road to Damascus. And that day when Jesus intervened, his life was transformed forever. And that's what happened to Niz that day when he went to church. God arrested his heart and changed him forever. And that is what happened to you the day that you finally responded to the gospel call. And that's what happened to me when I placed my faith in Jesus Christ. How did all of that happen? Because he did a work to transform us. It is God who has done the work, but it doesn't mean he has to do it on our timetable. Which brings us to the eighth question. This is a common rebuttal. Does that make us robots? Well, this is probably the thing I hear the second most in terms of a rejection of the doctrine of irresistible grace. It is the idea that if God is the one who does this work in us, then really that means that we don't have a choice at all. And that is completely untrue. Here's how they often present it. If God is the one who chooses whom to save and God is the one who draws us to himself, then doesn't that mean that nobody actually has any real choices in life and that we're just running in some kind of a cosmic computer program? Aren't we then just mindless automatons who carry out our programming? That is a common question. And there are three ways that I will address that question. And the first of them is without the scripture, but it is a point that this question is without the scripture. First, one of the worst mistakes that we make is to start philosophizing about the scripture without actually believing what the scripture says. If someone is unwilling to acknowledge, yes, the Bible is true, then of course they are going to reject everything it says about salvation. We have to start at the starting block of saying, this is not something we learn by way of philosophy or psychology. We are to understand the universe through the lens of what the scripture teaches us. That is God's word, and that is how we are to understand him. So to anyone struggling with this idea, I would just ask you to first look at the word of God and ask the question, what does God say? Because he has not been ambiguous about these things. He has set them out clearly for us in his word, and his way is both good and gracious. So look to the word for your answers not some kind of a secular textbook or any form of man-centered thought. We go to the scripture for our answer. Secondly, no, we are not robots because God never forces us to do anything that we don't want to do. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to. You sinned. Probably the last time you sinned was today, this morning. And why did you do that? 
You did that because you wanted to. And before you were in Christ, you rejected him. And why did you do that? Because you wanted to. And at some point, you did come to Christ and bowed your knee to him if you are in him. You did that because you wanted to. God has never coerced you or forced you to go against your will. What God does in salvation is he regenerates you so that a part of you that was previously dead is now alive and now desires things that you previously hated. Or maybe we're just disinterested in, as Nizzo said. We honor God now because we see that he is good. We see that he is perfect. We see that he is worthy of our obedience and our worship. So no, we are not robots because we are still operating within the boundaries of our own will. And thirdly, let's just say for the sake of argument that this is true, that we are mindless automatons. Then here's how this would respond, our, our lives would respond. If we were robots, then before we were saved, we would always do what was sinful, and we would always be the worst possible way we could be, and then after we were saved, we would never sin again. And that clearly is not true, and you know from experience, that is not how life works. But if we were robots running on a system where God takes his people and makes them obey, then he would always make them obey. That is the reason that we see we are by no means, we are not automatons. And we're going to look a lot more into how sanctification and that process of spiritual growth and renewal and transformation works in the life of a believer next week. But for now, we just need to land on the fact that because we live in a body that is under the curse of sin, we still sin. And we do that every time because we want to. We are still operating under our will. We are called now to fight sin, to mortify sin, to put sin to death. And that is a proof that we are not robots. Which brings us now to the ninth question, another objection. This is the most common one that is usually leveled against this doctrine of irresistible grace. It is the question, well, what about Jesus standing at the door and knocking? Now, here's the thing. We have to look at the text to actually understand what is it saying. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will eat with him and he with me. Now, clearly, if this is talking about salvation, if this is talking about somebody's heart being regenerated, then the Arminian would have a point. The problem is, this is not talking about salvation. Those who reject the idea of effectual calling will quote this passage and say, see, Jesus doesn't just barge in. He doesn't make anyone open the door. He's waiting for you to come in. He's just going to stand there, and he's going to knock as long as it takes until you let him in. But let me ask the question, to whom is Jesus speaking in this letter? This letter is addressed to the church at Thyatira. He is speaking to sinning Christians who have already been saved and who are already part of the church. In fact, we read in the verse directly above this one, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. He is clearly speaking here to Christians. This is not about salvation. It is a picture of sanctification, which brings us to our final question of the day, then what are the practical applications of this doctrine? Like, seriously, you might be saying to yourself, what does it matter that God is the one who regenerates and that regeneration precedes faith? Isn't this just kind of splitting theological hairs? Why bother even preaching on this? It seems like it's unimportant to me. Well, there are many applications I could have given you. I have narrowed it down to six for us today. First, pray for people to be saved. Vinny Nizzo's wife, Josie, prayed for him for 27 years faithfully and consistently. And by God's grace, the Lord answered those prayers, and he, not Josie, saved Niz. It was God who did the work of opening his understanding, not his wife, not the person preaching that day. It was God who opened his understandings. Arminians do not believe that God will ever do anything to impact someone's will. They do not believe that God will do the work of regeneration before someone decides they desire it. They hold the idea of human autonomy in such high regard that they view God's work of irresistible grace as an evil rather than a good. Consider these words from the book Against Calvinism by Roger Olson, who is, he has now passed away, but he was the former president of Baylor University, and he is an avid Arminian theologian. He said this in his book Against Calvinism. One day, 
At the end of a class session on Calvinism's doctrine of God's sovereignty, a student asked me a question that I had put off considering. He asked, if, if it was revealed to you in a way you could not question or deny that the true God actually is, as Calvinism says, and rules as Calvinism affirms, would you still worship him? I knew the only possible answer without a moment's thought, even though I knew it would shock many people. I said, no, that I would not because I could not. Such a God would be a moral monster. And if you read the book, he goes on to explain, if God affects someone's will, he is evil. Wow. I call that grace. Because if God left me to my own will, I would never have chosen him. But in grace, God has come and done a work in me. And if you were in Christ, he has done a work in you. But what does that have to do with prayer? Well, Arminians believe that if God works to invade the sovereignty of man, then God is overstepping his boundaries. Most Arminians would never say something as absurd as what Roger Olson said regarding the refusal to worship God, but they do agree with the sentiment that man's will is supreme and not to be trifled with. If you put God's will and man's will together, man's will always has to supersede. That is their view. That is the entire cornerstone of the entire doctrine of the Arminian faith. But is that, uh, if that is true, if that is true, then no Arminian should ever pray for an unbeliever to come to Christ. You cannot hold to, irresist or to resistible grace and believe that God should not impact your will and at the same time pray that God would draw your family members and impact their will. It is only those who believe that God truly has both the authority and ability to regenerate and grant faith and repentance who can legitimately pray that God would do so. And brothers and sisters, be faithful to pray. If you believe that God is the one who draws and you know that it's not you, then you can rely on him and go to him in prayer and bend the knee and ask him, please, Father God, do what I cannot. Make an inward call. We have hope in prayer because God draws with irresistible grace. Application two, there is no such thing as the sinner's prayer. Now, there is a formulation that has arisen in recent generation called the sinner's prayer. And God has used that to save many people. He has done so because as he is drawing someone effectually to himself, the person who has shared the outward call with them has led them to say, repeat after me, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. And then how many people here were saved through the sinner's prayer? Somebody led them in the sinner's prayer. I would guess at least some. Yeah, good, good number of hands have been raised. Many people have been led to the Lord through something like that. But do you know how many times the sinner's prayer, or something even remotely like it, is found in the Bible? The answer is zero times. And the reason that there are zero times is because this is not what actually saves a person. It is not the words that they say out loud that saves them. What actually causes them to be saved is first an inward work of transformation and regeneration, and then comes an outward profession of faith. Now that can come through a prayer. And for many in this room, I believe it has come through a prayer. But the Bible doesn't give us this example of the apostles leading people through the sinner's prayer, and I don't utilize this either. Many people respond to this outward call, but they never respond to the inward effectual call because they didn't receive one. And so the problem with the sinner's prayer is that many people receive an assurance of salvation even though they haven't actually trusted Christ. And they will look back and say, but I, I did pray that prayer, so I must be saved, even though I have gone on in my life and never changed even one bit. We'll talk more about what that looks like next week as we see progressive sanctification and the perseverance of the saints. But for de today, I just want to say that this is something that is a common tactic that is employed. Most commonly, it is used with children. Most often it is used in children's ministries to be persuasive and encourage them to do what we want them to do. We want every child that is down beneath my feet right now hearing the gospel, we want them to be saved. But we can't manipulate them to be saved and we cannot force them to be saved. But listen, I could convince almost any child to repeat words after me. I can become persuasive enough or kind enough or give them enough VBS candy to convince them to repeat after me. But does that mean there's actually been a transformation in the heart? It does not. So I do not utilize the tactic of the sinner's prayer. Instead, what do I do? I share the gospel. And I point people to the word of God. 
and I trust that God will draw his people to himself. And if somebody asks me to pray for them, I will never refuse to pray with anyone. And in fact, I will always encourage them and say, I want to pray for you. And when I evangelize, I will lead people to Christ, and I will point them to him for saving faith. But I do not say, if you want to be saved, pray these words after me. Because there is no evidence that God then has done a work in their heart. Now, application three is very closely related to two, that we at Gateway Church do not do altar calls. And the altar call is not a long-standing part of the Christian faith. In fact, it was invented in the 1850s, and it was a way to motivate people to turn their lives to Christ. So you can read the writings of people um, like Finney, who were very instrumental in the Second Great Awakening and who were responsible for a lot of the theology that comes out about how we do altar calls. Uh, You can read some of the modern writings. I I read a book a couple of years ago that talked about what temperature you should make the room if you want to convince people to come forward for for an altar call. And if you are going to make an altar call that is sad in tone, what temperature it should be. And if you are making one that's more fearful in tone, what temperature you should be, I call that manipulation. I do not call that evangelism. Uh, Just recently, I reconnected with a childhood friend, one of my closest friends from uh, one of my oldest friends, And by God's grace, he has done an amazing work in in this man's heart to change him and grow him and conform him to the image of his will. And my friend is now uh, not only walking with the Lord, but apart from my knowledge, has believed completely identically to what I believe theologically and what I'm teaching you today. That is the grace of God. Well, when we were children, we were in a play together and we were reminiscing about being in this play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. I'm curious, has anyone ever seen this play? Okay, so let me explain very briefly what happens. In this play, you have multiple vignettes, about 15 to 20 vignettes, which are little stories that take place where you see some people in life and what happens in the last moments of their life, and then they die. Maybe the building collapses on them. Maybe they overdose from drugs. Um, Maybe they die because they get into a car accident, but all of them end up the same way. They die, and then the lights go down, and the lights come up, and the backdrop has changed, and now they are standing before the great throne of God, and they are being judged, and God will either say, depart from me, I never knew you, or he would say, come enter into your rest, and they would go up and they would hug Jesus and they would play the hallelujah chorus. Or if they said no, then these demons would come out and the the lights would turn red and then they would come out and they would drag these people into the other side of the the stage, indicating that they had gone to hell. It was a terrifying, terrifying thing. And (laughs) I won't get into the details of how they painted people's faces and made them dress, and I mean, it's wild. But at the end, they would always have a a guy that would come and he would speak and he would share the gospel and he would invite people to come. And I was just reminiscing with my friend about this and I said, I remember him saying this. Can you verify that this is true? And sure enough, he said, yes, I absolutely remember that the way this man would give the altar call is he would always say, it would be faster and easier for you to come here and give your life to Christ than to go to McDonald's and get yourself a hamburger. That is not the call that we see in the scripture. And just to be clear, that is not the call that most people give when they give an altar call. But the point kind of remains. The point is, the entire purpose of that was to cause people to be emotional and fearful so that they would run to Jesus in that way. And were people ever saved at that event? The answer is maybe, probably. I don't really know. But is that the way the Bible teaches us to point people to Christ? I've never seen anything even remotely like that in the scripture. So what do we do instead here at Gateway? We preach the gospel, we preach the word, and we trust that God is going to do what he did for Vinnie Nizzo and open their eyes so that they will believe. Application four, you can be fearless in evangelism. Let me ask a question. Who was the better missionary in the Old Testament? Jonah or Jeremiah? Jonah was reluctant. You know him. He didn't even want to go to Nineveh. And then when he finally got there... What did he do? He literally wanted the people to refuse his message so that they would die a horrible death. He didn't want them to believe. Yet, if you look at all of the Old Testament prophets, it's likely that Jonah is the one who had the most results in his day. More people came to faith and repentance through his message than any of the other prophets that we see. And Jeremiah, on the opposite end, he was faithful, but he was not fruitful. Jeremiah worked every day to preach the gospel, and how many people listened? Nobody. For decades he went around, and that's why we call him the weeping prophet, because he kept weeping that no one would hear his message and believe. Who is a better missionary? I would argue it's Jeremiah, because he was more faithful, but it does not mean that more people will hear him. You see, if you believe in decisional regeneration, or resistible grace, 
then it is completely dependent upon your ability to persuade or manipulate or cajole or mentally outmaneuver those with whom you share the gospel so that you can convince them to come into the faith. And if those people don't come, in part, it is because you have not done enough to convince them. But that is not how Paul understood evangelism. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. These people were debating about which one is greater, Paul or Apollos, and Paul's like, look, neither one of us are anything. It's not us. We didn't make you come to Christ. We might have given you the seed, but that only grew because God gives the growth. If you believe in God's work in saving his people, then you can, like Paul, fearlessly share the gospel, and you can plant seeds and trust that God will save his people. Application five, worship the Lord in truth. We just, quite frankly, worship better when we know God better. The Holy Spirit is often overlooked or misunderstood. Consider the way that the doctrines of grace breaks down in regards to the Trinity. Let's just look at these T-U-L-I-P again. Total depravity. That means we are looking at man apart from God. Unconditional election. We see God the Father elects us to salvation. Limited atonement. God the Son atones for our salvation. And then irresistible grace, what we have focused on today. God the Spirit applies our salvation. And then we see perseverance of the saints next week, that that is man living under our salvation or living out our salvation. When people reject the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation, they are losing the main reason that we worship the Holy Spirit. His work of drawing us to salvation is the chief work that he presents in our lives. So instead, what many people do is they seek to worship him in ways that he is not told to be worshipped and in things that he does not do. Oftentimes, it is through the work of experience. That's the term that is usually used in modern circles, which really means nothing more than emotion. And when we understand the role of the Holy Spirit in giving us new life, then we can worship him properly, and we can give thanks to him rightly, and we can worship him according to who he is, not whom we have imagined him to be. Application six, irresistible grace results in humility. Now, if you've been here for all of the sermons in this series, you're probably starting to recognize a pattern. All of the sermons end in the same application, that these things produce humility. The doctrines of grace should cause us to be the most humble, thankful people in the world. If you believe that your salvation boiled down to your decision, then you have grounds to boast. If you still have your fingers, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, read it again with me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Why did God set up salvation this way? So that no one may boast. If grace is resistible, then you are to be commended as one of those wise ones, better ones, more clever, more daring ones who would respond to the call of God where everyone else does not. But as it stands, we have no grounds for boasting because it is God who works in us through his effectual calling. So to close, let me just leave you with Paul's question to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that you indeed do save us. And you do that by giving us new life, new birth. That you cause us to be made alive where we were previously dead in our trespasses and sins. And God, I thank you that you give the gift of faith so that we will trust in you. And that you give the, faith, the gift of repentance so that we will turn from our sin and turn to you in obedience. And I thank you, God, that you are the one who does the work of causing us to love you. I thank you, God, that you have given us this great gift of salvation. Lord, I thank you that salvation is all of you. Lord, I pray that we would be a humble people, a loving people, a prayerful people, an evangelistic people because of this good news. I ask, Father God, that you would help us to love you and that we would adore you and be thankful to you rightly because of the great work you have done in saving us from our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.